keeping those records and stuff like that is really important. And that way, you know how many times you've treated a certain calf and how many um, or percentage of calves that you're having to treat in that situation too, if you're having an outbreak of something. Because after you've reached a certain percentage level, and that's something you should work out with your veterinarian or whoever's helping with your develop your herd health protocol. That way you can call those higher up for advice or when you're having an issue and know when you may need to implement a scour vaccine or what's going on here, you know, something along those lines. And I think that, that having those records really helps because if you're not recording and calculating or keeping records of how many times you've treated that same calf, do you have a chronic problem? Hey, hey, I'm Shay Keister, and I'm your host for the Casual Cattle Conversations podcast, where we connect you with members of the beef industry who can help you build a more profitable operation. As you listen to each episode, be sure to set an intention for the show. What do you want to get out of it, and how do you want to use this information to make changes on your operation? If you're looking for more ranching resources outside of what's being shared on these podcast episodes, sign up for my free weekly newsletter. I'll send branching information and podcast episodes straight to your inbox every week. In addition to that, you will also receive a free PDF with 22 ranch management tips from the gurus who have been on my show. The link to sign up for that is in the show notes. With that, let's hear from our guests today and discover how we can improve the beef industry and our own unique cattle operations. Okay, so I'm here with Chelsea and Wes today, and for those of you out here listening, we're going to talk about calving, and specifically spring calving, because, uh, well, up north, I guess it's still winter and spring's on our mind. Down south, the seasons might be a little different for you folks, but to start off, I'm going to have Wes and Chelsea introduce themselves, and we're going to start with Chelsea today. So Chelsea, can you just offer a little bit of background on where you're from and what you do in the beef industry? Yeah, so I'm uh, Chelsea Woodcock. I am a boat, well, large animal veterinarian, heavily beef um, interest here. Um, I'm located in Coal Camp, Missouri, um, which is pretty much central west Missouri. Um, I did not grow up here. I, uh, I graduated from Michigan State in 2020 with my veterinary degree. And before that, um, I did a year and a half in New Mexico working with a mixed animal practitioner there. And before that, I grew up in the to California with my family raising uh, Charlie breeding cattle. Um, I was pretty active in showing from 4-H level all the way up to the national level and served as um, the area director for the Charlie breed for the West Coast for quite some time um, and have always had a genuine passion for beef cattle and now I get to put that to use every single day with my clients. Well that's awesome. There's definitely a need for large animal vets, and especially those in the beef industry. So I'm glad to see you're a part of that. Wes, do you want to reintroduce yourself? I know you've been on the show before. It's always good to have you back on, but maybe people didn't catch that first episode or two. So So, uh, my name is Wes Chisholm. I am uh, just had a recent role change, actually. Um, I'm the business development manager for animal performance and traceability for Gallagher North America. So with that role, just kind of looking over and trying to make sure that our company provides our, you know, the producers and our end users the, the best scale and uh, EID equipment to really meet their needs and make sure that we're where we need to be in the industry. Um, I was been with Gallagher for, oh, since 2015. And before that, I was a fieldman actually for the Charlotte Association in Southwest U.S. and um, grew up originally in Kentucky and got a degree at University of Kentucky before I went west. So otherwise, it's, just kind of a long story after that. <laughs> well, I'm glad to have you back on. You definitely have a passion for helping beef producers improve their herds. So I'm excited to have both of you on today. But to kind of get started and dive into the topic of calving, Chelsea, can you just kind of start off and talk about, you know, what supplies, what does that calving checklist look like to make sure producers are prepared before the calving season hits, what are some of those items that they should have on their list to make calving season go as smoothly as possible, even though we always know there's probably going to be a hiccup here or there? 
Yeah, absolutely. And I really honestly think it kind of varies from different types of producers. So you have some that are more of a hobby farm, smaller oriented, all the way up to your large ranches that are 50 plus cows. Um, I think you're have the the tools that you have on hand are kind of be a little bit different for both of those just because of the amount of calves you're expecting. Um, I don't expect my backyard farmer, hobby farmer to have a full set of chains and a calf jack when there's a problem, but I would expect some of my bigger producers to probably have that. And when I'm going to get a call, it's going to be a disaster zone on those bigger farms. Um, whereas our hobby farmers, they might just call whenever they're, they're having difficulty seeing that calf and just need a simple pull done. Um, so I think some uniform things that everyone should have on hand, especially in the spring season, because we're dealing with wet or colder weather is, you know, maybe eight towels should be in your box, um, just to help kind of start getting that calf ruffled up. If they see something still being cold, um, colostrum, especially with first time heifers, um, they're not always the most adept at taking on their calves and, it's always good to have some backup classroom on hand just to make sure that that calf is getting it and getting the best start to life. Iodine to dip that navel, especially like I said, what weather you want to get that dried up as quickly as possible so that we're not waking up any bacteria up into that navel and starting some kind of septic infection before that calf has a start to life. Um, I always say on those bigger farms, you're probably going to have some chains, your handles, lube, um, OB sleeves, cap jack, some way to restrain the cow is probably going to be <laughs> key to that. If you're needing to intervene, um, and halter shoot something along those lines. Um, I, I would also recommend having the phone number for your local veterinarian or whoever does your herd health on hand, just in case you get into one of those sticky situations, which requires a little bit more intervention. Um, once that calf is on the ground, you want some kind of form of record keeping, or at least I really recommend doing that. Um, that way, you know, which cows have calved, which calves have belong to which cow, um, some kind of form of their birth weights, especially if you're doing any seed stock production. Um, and going from there, you know, those are kind of my go-tos at least. Yeah, that sounds like a very complete list. And I appreciate you breaking it down for kind of what you expect out of your smaller producers versus your larger producers who are making more of a living off of it, treating it more as a business structure. Now, it might sound like a little bit of a broken record because we talk about record keeping a lot on this show with various different guests. <laughs> it's not just Gallagher. It's about every guest I have on here. It seems like record keeping gets brought up at some point. But Wes, do you have any tips on ways to collect that data efficiently and what that can look like for cow-calf producers? Yeah, I mean, if you, I mean, you can go back to the beginning of it all with, you know, the little red book and taking notes and doing it by hand, but, you know, technology's kind of progressed so fast in the arena of record keeping just in the last few years. Um, you know, we've got a lot of guys that take them on their phones now. Um, they use Excel, um, you move past that, you know, with our systems, you can, you know, enter it right onto the scale head pair that calf up with its mother, like Chelsea was talking about, and you know, which cows have calved and the date and the birth weight. Um, if you have, you know, a calving issue, you can record it in the system right then. Um, you know, and it's kind of, you were talking about a broken record, but it's kind of one of those same things. It surprises me so often when we're helping producers that they're not really sure when those cows are supposed to start calving. And so to me, it's just, it blows my mind, but I mean, it's so simple to go back and start those records, either the bull turnout dates, you know, if you saw a set of cows actually standing in heat, getting bred, record those dates. Um, if you're AI and write that down, record that in your system, um, then you're not really surprised when that first calf comes. Um, there's not a mad scramble to move a set of calving cows up closer to the barn and instead of forgetting that they were in the back 40. So, yeah, I mean, like I said, you said a little bit of a broken record, but those, I mean, in today's world with the profit margins the way they are and stuff, every little bit helps. Oh, absolutely. And even tracking treatment records, if that is the case, is very important too. And I'm sure Chelsea could talk a little bit about that too. I mean, that's important for veterinarians to know if you're yeah. animals in. 
Absolutely. So like Wes is saying, we can see all kinds of forms of uh, record keeping out there. Um, our clinic actually, when we go out to do any type of herd health, whether we're going out because a producer is having a huge illness breakout um, or we're doing vaccine protocols for whatever reason we're on the farm, we actually have several um, Excel format sheets that we do and provide those records for our clients. Um, and I think that's becoming an even more and more standard. And there's lots of lots of online recording systems now for EID tags and electronic tags that are syncing up, which will make it even easier for producers. Um, breaking that cost down for why it's important, especially in this market, producers are starting to see the cost benefit there. And I think we'll continue heading in that direction. Um, for us, I mean, it's good to utilize birth weights or current weight of that animal in order for us to give the appropriate amount of antibiotics or um, supplemental, like a multiman shot or something along those lines. That way, one, we're not overdosing animals and exposing them to more antibiotics than necessary. Um, two, it's going to hit your pocketbook a little bit harder if you are estimating a calf to be 600 pounds and it's really 400 pounds because you're using two more cc's of, or at least an example, you know, something along the lines of Draxon or Zaprevo, you're going to be using two cc's more of that product than you would be if you actually knew that calf's weight. So it'll save you money in the long run to at least have those scales. I think that's personally something that I like to see clients looking to invest if they're trying to add something to their um, repertoire, you know, on their farm is scales go a long ways and they'll save you money along the way too. Um, does that answer that question, I guess? <laughs> yeah, I, th I think that was great insight <laughs> and a great conversation to have. Now kind of sticking on the herd health track of this, when we're looking at making sure those calves stay healthy throughout the calving season, now calving season varies depending on each producer, as we talked before, but what are some of those actions that producers can take to make sure those calves do stay healthy throughout the calving season? Yeah. So I think it all goes all the way back to that pre-breeding season. So before this calf has even been conceived, priming that mom with the proper modified live vaccines um, to get her geared up for a breeding season and carrying all the way through, um, especially trying to prevent any abortive diseases. I mean, you can't have a calving season without the calf first. So I think it goes all the way back to that, um, making sure that she's an appropriate body condition score going into that calving season, because but we know about 30 days is where she's going to hit that prime of milking and everything else. And first calf heifers tend to be the ones that take the biggest hit, um, they're still growing and trying to maintain their own body condition and growth rate along with trying to grow a calf and then growing that calf alongside them once it's out. Mm -hmm. So taking into an account of the body condition and make sure you're supplementing the right amount of nutrition, especially this time of year where grass is covered by snow in some certain areas of the year um, and others we're in a dead season, no growth going on. So we're having to give silage or hay or additional grain just to help keep those cows going and keeping that body condition appropriate. And along those lines, going into your season, you should have that hay tested to make sure that the quality and nutrition is there. Um, otherwise you might need to be supplementing with some kind of protein licks and other sources that way. Um, the other thing I harp on clients about is making sure that the calf is getting colostrum within the first, ideally, ideally first 12 hours of that calf's life. We know that after 24 hours, the gut is closed. We know that it starts shutting down in between six to 12 hours. I really like to see calves up and going within the first hour to two hours of life and really getting it latched onto that cow. Now we can't supervise every cow and calf in that situation, but if we go out you know, we did our checks this morning and then we came out this afternoon and we see a calf that looks like it's been looked off, dried off, but it's really kind of struggling to get about. That might be a calf I target to investigate a little bit more, see if it mom's bag is full or if we think it needs a little help and support. And that's where having that extra classroom on hand really goes long ways. Um, you know, another thing that I think about is it's a wet season. We're more set up for scours this time of year. So, you know, if that's, if you've never had a scour issue on your farm, then you probably don't have much of a reason to worry. Um, but if you are consistently battling it year in and year out, you might consider 
implementing a scour guard vaccine in your herd. So usually we recommend if it's the first time doing that 60 days and then a booster 30 days before calving season is due to start. Um, that way we're priming that colostrum. And then if it seems like that generic, because there's a few different ones, there's Guardian, there's scour guard, there's several brands out there. Um, but if that generic isn't working for you and you're still having outbreaks of scours, then you might be wanting to collect some of that from a calf that hasn't been treated yet um, and sending it off to find out what the exact pathogen is and maybe having a individual vaccine developed for your farm. Um, we have a couple of clients that do that each year. Uh, the other things that I can think of are implementing, especially on larger farms, um, a calving seat, you know, calving wise, implementing a sand hills calving system. Um, for those that aren't familiar with that, you're going to have all your cows start, or your herd or group of cows start on one pasture, let them calve for two weeks on that pasture. Any cow that hasn't calved at that time, you're going to move them to a new clean pasture. That way your older calves are not mixing with your younger calves and spreading disease and, um, you know, infections that way and so on and so forth until all your calves are over the youngest calves born are within four weeks, you know, old, and then you can commingle them back. Now, not every farm has that much pasture. So if we're able to at least implement a segregation between a group or two, that, that would help drastically reduce your risk for getting scours and give those calves a better um, outlook in life starting out. After that, you know, you want to wait at least 30 to 45 days before you start thinking about vaccinating those calves because we really don't want to stress them in that critical new period of life. Wow, you answered a lot of questions <laughs> I was going to ask you, Chelsea. Great job. <laughs> no um, I but I do, do that on a daily basis, right? <laughs> but um, I do want to go back to a couple of points. So you talked about the Sand Hills calving method. Now, I've also seen producers where instead of like kicking out the calves that or the cows that haven't calved yet, they kick out the pairs and still leave the ones that are left to calve in that same spot. Is that still effective or is that risk still really high for that contamination that could have came from those older calves? Yeah. So, I mean, I think it's better than nothing. Um, but it is certainly not the most ideal because those cows and cows have already been on that pasture and calving out in that pasture. So it's already con technically contaminated. Um, it'd be more ideal to move those bred cows off than the cows with pairs, which honestly, it should be more of an easy task to move the bred cows because we're not, they're not struggling behind trying to look for that, their calf and trying to move two animals versus one animal still at that time. So in theory, it should be easier to move the bread versus the pear. Okay. Thank you for explaining that. Now, my other question goes back to, you mentioned not to vaccinate the calves as newborns, right? Right. I, I mean, we generally recommend waiting until they're at least 30 to 45 days. Now I'm not going to say I show up in May and start doing my pre-breeding vaccines because the bulls are going out in the next three weeks and there's still some cow strug straggling to have a calf, you know, um, or someone calved out that day and doc, you're not going to be back until the fall. So yes, do we vaccinate calves that are probably less than four weeks of age? Yeah, it happens, but that's not the ideal time to be doing the majority of your calves born at that time. You, you want to ideally give them 30 to 45 days. I know I have some clients that struggle with scours really badly. So they'll do like a first defense bolus or some kind of early defense E. coli shot for calves. I consider that different than a full on vaccination program for respiratory disease or clostridial vaccines. Those are the ones I'd recommend waiting until they're at least 30 to 45 days. Generally, somewhere around the time that you're thinking about doing your pre breeding vaccines on your cows would be an ideal time to get that first set of vaccines in on your calves. That way you're only getting them up once and um, you're kind of able to sort the cows from the calves and get it all done then. Well, awesome. I guess to kind of wrap up today, Wes, you can chime in too, but do each yeah. of you kind of want to 
share any parting thoughts or like any, like if a person could only take away one thing from this podcast episode, what would you like them to take away from today? Something I guess I'd like to mention before we go is, you know, as we go forward and you're treating calves or treating cows, you're starting either the pre-breeding process or even, you know, if you're working a set of cows, like Chelsea said, right after they've calved, um, you know, the big thing I'd like to tell producers is make sure you're keeping track of, you know, what you're giving the cows, how much you're giving, make sure you're giving the accurate amount. Chelsea mentioned it earlier, you know, some of the worst things you can do is either overdose or underdose. I mean, if you're not given the appropriate amount of medication, no matter what it is, um, you're either going to build a worse problem or you're not actually helping solve the one that you're trying to treat immediately. And that's where I think a lot of guys need to make sure they're looking at the systems they're using, make sure they're looking at the records they're keeping and using the proper equipment to make sure they're doing the right thing. We just launched a new set of systems in our scale heads for treatments. So we can track. So like if you were working a set of cows, I can program in every drug you're going to give. It'll kick out the ideal dosages based on weight. And then you can record that. Um, I'd like to touch on that, but I'm not really sure how. It's just been out like two weeks now. So we haven't even got to have like good discussions about it yet in the field. Awesome. Chelsea, what parting thoughts do you have? I'm going to jump in on kind of something that Wes just said too. I mean, keeping those records and stuff like that is really important. And that way, you know, how many times you've treated a certain calf and how many, um, or percentage of calves that you're having to treat in that situation too, if you're having an outbreak of something, because after you've reached a certain percentage level, and that's something you should work out with your veterinarian or whoever's helping with your develop your herd health protocol. That way you can call those higher up for advice or when you're having an issue and know when you may need to implement a scour vaccine or what's going on here, you know, something along those lines. And I think that, that having those records really helps because if you're not recording and calculating or keeping records of how many times you've treated that same calf, do you have a chronic problem? Is there a BVD outbreak in your herd? You know, these other questions that you can be going to your veterinarian to help you fix a problem and reduce the calf loss along the way too. So that's something I wanted to add on on that. It's a good idea to keep records, records, records. <laughs> All righty. Well, keep records for yourself to improve your herd and uh, keep records to keep your veterinarian happy because they can help you better too. So and your nutritionist <laughs> and your whole team, it helps everyone. Yes. But well, Chelsea and Wes, thank you for taking time out of your Thursday to be on the show today and talk about spring calving and record keeping and everything producers need to know who are prepping for that season right now. Thanks for having us. Thanks, guys. And that's a wrap on that one, folks. Thank you for tuning in today and joining in on the conversation. Be sure to take this a step further and take the advice you learned and implement it on your operation. If you want to have a conversation about it, head over to my social media and send me a DM by following at Cattle Convos and connecting with me there. Have a great day.